everyone. Welcome to the first official lecture of TFIL 251 Data and Discourse COVID-19 edition. We're doing this all online this quarter. I think it's a class that's actually fairly well suited to going online because we spend so much of our time online parsing data claims, reading different information, re reading different sources of information about what's going on in the world that use data for the basis of their support for arguments. Hopefully this class is going to help you sort through some of that and understand it better. What I want to get out of today's session, and I don't really have a great idea how long I'm going to talk, but I know that I want to keep it fairly short because a hour long YouTube is about the most boring thing in the world. Uh, if it's just me and the, the green screen here. Uh, <clears throat> but the, 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 my goals in my introductory video were just to say hi and let you know about the broad contours of the class. My goal here today is to introduce chapter one and also more fully introduce myself. I think it's important to know who your teacher is and it's important for me to know who you are. There's going to be an assignment posted to the week one folder. Uh, there's actually two folders per week now, but it, it'll be someplace in the, um, the week one modules and it'll be a discussion board where you get to introduce yourself yourself to your classmates and to me. Obviously, it's going to be there for everyone to read, so you don't need to be too personal, but the idea is that we can get to know each other a little bit at least. We will be engaging in discussions all quarter long. I like to do discussions in class. I know that we can't really replicate that perfectly. I'm willing to consider doing Zoom sessions for discussions, but I'm not quite sure how that's going to work for everybody, so I'm open to the idea. I'd like to have your feedback about it and tell me what you think about that idea. Uh, for now, though, we're going to have a discussion board where you post a biography and some comments about what you're looking for, where you're coming from, what your own biases might be, uh, what you want to get out of the class, that kind of thing. Just by way of introducing myself, uh, one of the ways you can get to know me is actually through my social media. Uh, some of it you probably don't want to look at too closely because I'm not always the, um, my best version of myself on social media, but, um, I've actually stopped using, um, so Instagram because I am unhappy with the, uh, the, um, the policies of Instagram and Facebook with regard to political, um, advertising and fake news. They have, um, taken a stance that they allow people to post outright falsehoods as long as they pay Facebook uh, money, so I don't like that. But if we take a look at, um, wait a minute, there's somebody with a, uh, a name very like mine. <laughs> uh, what you can see from my profile um, looking at Instagram, because of course it's a perfect representation of my life, um, is that this is all from it looks like I stopped posting around half a year ago or so was when I finally decided to have enough. Uh, you can tell I have a family. I have two kids and a dog. I have a son with a disability, uh, actually with multiple disabilities. And uh, that makes life uh, more interesting and more challenging at the same time. Uh, that was at UW Tacoma, actually. There you go. Yeah. Um, I like to do stuff with my kids outdoors. That's been more of a challenge with the uh, shelter in place or stay at home rules, however we want to interpret those, um, but really like to travel as well. This gives us, me an opportunity actually to tell you about my, uh, my, my regular gig, I should say. Um, I don't want to discount my, my role at University of Washington Tacoma because it's a very important job and I really value uh, working at UW Tacoma, especially teaching this class with you all as my students. But my regular job is actually as a professor of uh, geography at Green River College in Auburn, Washington. So I'll get students to come through uh, from, from uh, Green River to UW sometimes, and I'll have them again for my TFIL class as well as a geography class. That's kind of fun. Uh, anyway, this is a, a lot of travel photos, and one of the things I like to do as a geographer is to do a lot of travel. For that reason, a lot of the examples that we'll encounter this quarter are geographic in nature. Data and discourse applies to 
uh, state level comparisons, national level comparisons, international comparisons are a really uh, common source of comparison when we look at policy design and try and talk about which policies work in what, what countries. So it's a natural sort of thing to do. We'll talk about when that can be useful and when it can be a challenge and why that is the case. That's coming up later on uh, this quarter already. So I like to travel, I like my family. The other thing that's a big theme, this is a trip I took to Tanzania last summer with my family, uh, really good time. And you can feel free to stalk me on Instagram, um, follow me or whatever. I am holding pretty fast to my boycott of that platform. Uh, and I'm, I'm not quite sure if I'm even gonna take it down, but you can, you can always go and lurk and check out my profile if you want. <laughs> um, I just wanted to share this because it's a nice way to just give you a quick tour of what I'm about. You can also check out my YouTube channel, uh, which is a, another way of learning about some of my travels and some of the things I'm interested in besides traveling. Uh, what you'll see and let's just let's just fast forward through all these photos here because um, uh oh uh oh it wants me to log in <laughs> um, I don't know if we're gonna get there that's okay uh, another thing another big theme that I really like to do is skiing and that's been cut short because all the ski areas are closed and as a matter of fact most places have put a ban on uphill travel even within those closed ski areas you're not supposed to be out and recreating because you don't want to put uh, undue stress on the uh, on search and rescue if you get lost or on other services even if you get your car stuck you're not supposed to be out even recreating right now which makes it a little tough anyway that's a really quick glimpse of my life uh, i so I, part of the message in this is obviously i'm uh, i'm dedicated to my family i am an equal co-parent with my partner and i'm really devoted to taking care of my kids we're homeschooling uh, the kids right now and uh, fortunately for me my wife is a uh, a, a kindergarten first grade teacher and so that takes some of the weight off my shoulders because I would be really lost without that. Uh, at the same time it's really stressful for her to be a, a, a parent and a teacher to our children and so I'm trying to help as much as I can. That's putting a lot of strain on my resources because I'm also trying to teach you all and I'm moving my geography classes online. Now I have taught geography online before uh, and I, it, so it's not as big of a transition for me as maybe for some of your professors, but at the same time, I am feeling stressed about having to teach everything online, including this class is a new prep for me, and two of my classes are two new online preps for me at Green River College. So hopefully that's not going to be too much of a strain on me. Uh, I recognize the message I'm trying to con communicate to you here is that I recognize what it's like to feel like there's way too much to do and not enough time to do it in and we'll be okay, we'll get through it and we're not going to be too hardcore about just piling more and more on. I want to make sure we get our goals met for the quarter without making it too, um, too extreme of a condition for anyone to, to thrive in. So, uh, <clears throat> let's talk about the class structure really quick. I've got the class set up here in um, the the student view so this is the same thing you should see when you log in and what we should note and I'm, my big head's in the way here um, I think it's okay I'll, I'll keep my head in the way for a little while and um, this technology I'm trying this out with the whole like weather map kind of thing and I'm not sure if I'm going to keep it this way I have another tool I like to use it just puts my face in a little bubble and I can move the bubble around I might switch to that we'll see Give me some feedback if you want about whether it's working for you or not. I can't always follow your recommendation, but like look better. Okay. Sorry. Can't help that. Uh, but I'll, I'll do my best to try and accommodate uh, some, some, some feedback if, if the feedback is, is something that I can easily fix and try and make the class better or easier to, to follow for you. Anyway, this is a view you should see when you log in is this um, homepage like this. Uh, Let's see, I should move out of the way this way, shouldn't I? Yes, that way you can see the whole page. Aha, okay. Uh, anyway, when you log in, you get the little welcome video that I already sent a link around for, and then most of the class will be run through modules here. And when you open it up, you should see week one, unit one, and week one, unit two. Just so you know, I'm gonna keep the organization that way because the class right now is organized the way I taught it face-to-face -face two days a week. And so each one of these was a day of class with two days per week. That's out the window, but I just have week one, unit one, and unit two, which would have been day one and day two. 
What I've got in week one, unit one, is the course syllabus, and that's got a few things that might be subject to change, including some readings in future chapters. What I'm going to do with this class being all online because of the COVID-19 crisis is I'm going to use the opportunity presented by the COVID-19 uh, crisis to critically analyze a lot of data claims around the COVID-19 uh, crisis, everything about it. I wanted to say about its transmission, but its transmission, it's, um, I want to, this is better. Yes. Okay. Um, it's transmission. It's um, uh, the the number of people that might have the infection that we don't know about. The um, the mortality rate and unknowns about the mortality rate. Whether countries are hiding data or not. Um, the availability of personal pe uh, protective equipment. All these different areas of the COVID nineteen crisis. All these different domains of the COVID nineteen crisis. Um, all have numbers attached to them. And one of the things that we run into in American society is we like numbers because they give us a sense of concrete authority. But what we're gonna learn in this class is that numbers aren't always the truth. There's a lot of different ways to count things. There's a lot of different ways to measure things. There's a lot of unknowns involved in statistics. And we're gonna be poking at the edges of what those knowns and unknowns are and understanding what makes some numbers more authoritative, what makes some statistical claims more authoritative, and what makes some, pardon the phrase, but absolute bullshit. So here we go. What I have for us right away is some now fairly dated uh, links to a couple different videos. And I do like these videos. This one is a TED Talk from um, David McCandless is now 10 years old. And back when this was a TED Global Talk, this was very cutting edge. The data visualization that he is showing and demonstrating in this is still effective, but it is now old news. It's now pretty commonplace to see really good data visualization. Uh, the reason I like to start off with this though is because it brings us to this idea that in the last decade, we've seen a transformation of the way people are visualizing data to understand complex relationships better, to understand extremely large numbers better, especially large numbers in uh, in proportion to other numbers and the like. And so it's a 18 minute video. I'd recommend you watch through it and get an idea about it. I think you'll find it interesting and entertaining for some of it. And then the other video I like to show here is um, this one by Hans Rosling. May he rest in peace. He passed away about a year ago. R.I.P. Hans Rosling, Dr. Rosling, who was a professor of demography specializing in epidemiology uh, from Sweden, I believe. And his work is really pathbreaking. In this video, it's a little bit older. It's a TED Talk as well. Um, and 2009, so about the same era as that one. But the, um, the Rosling TED Talk is really useful. And the reason I like to start off the whole class with it is because his argument here is if we don't change our view of the world based on data that contradicts our idea of the world or that informs our idea of the world, then what's even the point about talking about what we know if we aren't allowed to change our minds because we get new information? That's really fundamental to this class. Sooner or later, we're gonna talk about an issue that you'll find yourself on one side or another of a partisan divide. More and more things in American society are getting partisan shifts about. So where you view an issue, how you view an issue, depends a lot on your, your personal political views, your, your orientation towards being more conservative or being more liberal. And the way we see the world is increasingly polarized based on our political orientation more than it is about any particular objective measurement of the world. Before you get all proud of yourself and say, well, I'm on the right side, that cuts both ways. Now, this is a good time to think about this because it's right at the start of the quarter and we're going to head into all these issues and all this discussion. Rosling's point is a great one, which is, I have data that shows you the world is not the way you think it is. 
Are you going to allow that to influence the way you think about the world? Or are you going to dismiss it and just say that can't be right? Because that's where we are right now in partisan politics is someone gives you data that is disconfirming of your beliefs, that is contrary to your, your beliefs. And sometimes your gut reaction is to say, no, that can't be that can't be true. Right. We'll get into that in more detail very soon. But this is a great entry to it. The other thing I want to go with on this right now is I want to take a minute to take Rosling's examples here and talk about this in the context of COVID-19 in the context of what we can learn from data visualization that really makes us think about the world. This is something that I do for my 100 level geography classes that really gets a lot of students to think differently about the United States and about the problem of healthcare in the United States. So let's get to this right here. It's, it's um, we search for Gapminder world, we get the Gapminder tool and Rosalind goes through an earlier version of this, a 10 year old or 11 year old version of this. This one's much more sophisticated now. But what this tool does is it allows us to visualize countries. And I'm going to actually get my head out of the way here. Boop, there I go. Uh, and you should still see my cursor on there. There it is. Yeah. Uh, what this allows us to do is it allows us to select countries and look at different variables visually displayed compared to other countries. What we've got right now is the life expectancy at birth on the left-hand axis, the vertical axis. So taller is a longer life expectancy and down shorter here on this axis, down near the near the origin is shorter life expectancy. And then the, the um, uh, x-axis here, the uh, horizontal axis is measuring income. And you can always check to what, see what they're measuring. This is always a good question is, well, what do they mean when they say income? It's measured as gross domestic product per person adjusted for differences in purchasing power. In other words, some countries uh, have a high cost of living and some have a low cost of living. So they've adjusted for that so that we're comparing countries on the same yardstick GDP per person. So these are the rich countries over here at the far right hand side. And these are the poor countries over here at the far left hand side. And so you can see the United States right here, which is fairly long lived and uh, fairly wealthy. And you can do things like take your magnifying glass. And don't worry if you're just wondering about when this is going to be on the test. We're just looking at this as a data visualization tool. I'm not going to quiz you about this. But one of the things I always quiz my students in my intro to geography class is I ask them to tell me, look at the graph, I say. And are there any countries that are, let me make sure I get the direction right here, that are poorer than the US and yet have a longer life expectancy than the US? And we should be able to see right away here that, yeah, there are. There's, there's a, as a matter of fact, there's not just some countries that are both poorer than the US and have a longer life expectancy. There's, there's many. Right? There's a whole cluster of them over here. This right away is where we start running into this problem I brought up with respect to the Rosling uh, presentation, which is cognitive dissonance sets in. And if we're the kind of person that thinks the United States is a good, good country, and I, I like the United States, I'm an American, I was, I was born here and socialized here, and I can think, well, it's not a bad place to live. But if we're the kind of person who thinks fairly defensively that the United States is a great place and that having another country be better at something the United States threatens our view of the world and how great the United States is, then these data can't be right is one possible explanation. And I, what I see is I see my students in their responses go through this, this knee jerk, almost instinctual sort of reaction about explaining away how there are so many countries. Where are we here? so many countries that are both poorer than the US and yet longer life expectancies. One natural reaction seems to be, or I don't want to say natural, I just, natural or instinct isn't the right term. One common reaction seems to be, well, the United States has some groups of people that are prone to crime or something. So it's blaming it on the other, even with the United States is a common reaction. And another reaction is to say something like, well, those countries are smaller in population of the United States. And I'm like, okay, so what if we looked at individual states in the US? Could we not see a lot of places that were smaller than those countries and would have bad statistics as well? 
We can do the same thing, by the way, if we look over here at child mortality. And if we look at child mortality, I'm going to change the scale on this graphic again. Again, we're just playing around with some data visualization to think about what numbers mean and think about how we react to numbers when we see some that might challenge our view of the world. Here we've got a graph, we've got a, a, a vertical axis here that is deaths per 1,000 births before age five. So 10 children die before their fifth birthday of a thousand born five children die before their first birth the fifth birthday before for every 1000 born or in some countries as few as two or a little bit less than two children per 1000 born die before their fifth birthday now these numbers are all very low on a worldwide scale that we're talking about right now because there's some places where child mortality is quite high quite a bit higher than this but i hope we can agree that 10 children dying before their fifth birthday is a lot worse than three or two children dying. I hope we can all agree on that, right? Same axis here, which is income. So these are the rich countries over here. These are the middle income countries over here. These are the poor middle income, still, still middle income, but poor middle income countries. And again, what I do here is I challenge my students. I say, are there any countries that are poorer than the U.S. and yet have lower child mortality than the US. This is where it gets really interesting, the tricks our brain can play on us because a lot of us like to think of the US as a good place. I like to think of the US as a good place. I like to think of it as a place that could be improved on some things, like child health, but I like to think of the US as a, as a good place more, more, more often than not. So if we are presented with this data that, that if we're thinking about the US as being number one, it's easy to say, well, yes, the U.S. is number one in income. That's very obvious. But here's what happens when students get this information and it challenges their pre-existing idea of what the U.S. is good at or not so good at. What they do is they read the graph wrong. They look at this and they say, well, the U.S. is higher in income and it's higher in child mortality. It's better in child mortality than all these other countries. In other words, they didn't bother, and we're going to come into a reading that talks about this in much more detail um, soon. Don't worry, it's coming. They don't bother to say which is better, 10 kids per 1,000 dead or 2 kids per 1,000 dead. They just look at the trend and say, well, it's better, it's, it's on top, because it confirms their pre-existing beliefs. So that's what Hans Rosling is challenging you to think about the world. That's what I'm challenging you to think about the world is if you're presented with data that contradicts your idea of the world is your first reaction to just dismiss it and say it can't be right or does it make you think about what you know and reconsider what you know if the answer is always the former then this class is largely pointless because you can just make up a number that confirms everything you already know if you're really eager to learn about the world and willing to change your mind about some things then this class is really going to be great for you because it'll help you think about what you know and what you don't know, how sure you are of some things, and how willing to be wrong you are on others, right? So that's where I wanted to start out with this here. Just to relate this back to COVID-19 like I was going to talk about, if we look at these relatively poor numbers for a place like the United States compared to the rest of the, of the this, this is mostly uh, Europe, mostly Western Europe, and then some countries in East Asia, like South Korea and Japan, are really good at having low numbers in child mortality. If we look at what's going on here, as well as in the life expectancy numbers, uh, the best explanation we have for this is that those countries all have much more comprehensive, universal health care. There's different systems in every one of these countries. Some are more similar to others, others than not. But the United States is the only really industrialized, uh, fully developed country that doesn't have health care of some sort for everybody in the population. Because of that, there's a significant portion of the population in the United States that doesn't have easy access to medical care, doesn't have the ability to get preventative care from a physician. They need to wait until they're sick enough to go to the emergency room if they do that at all. And so that we have short life expectancies and more child deaths because of that. So. 
How you want to solve that, I'm going to leave up to you. I'm not going to be prescriptive about policy, but understanding the nature of the problem is the first step to solving it. So that's where we're going in, with, with this kind of thing in this, in this class. On to some more data visualization examples. These are going to be all over the place, and people have been looking at exponential graphs more and more often with respect to the COVID um, uh, uh, epidemic, pandemic, I should say. Uh, this is a site called healthdata.org with the COVID-19 um, prefix on there. Um, this is from the uh, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, which is a UW-based center for measuring all sorts of different health problems and health issues. And they've been really working hard on this. This is a model. And this is a great example of the, a little bit of the tension between what some people on the ground get really frustrated by, but then epidemiologists are constantly trying to, uh, to, to model, uh, which is that we're looking here at, in the United States, the, the, um, the peak resource use is forecast for April um, 15th. Um, they're forecasting 220,000 beds needed, uh, a total of 32,000 ICU beds needed across the United States, and a total of around 26,000 invasive ventilators needed. And then they've got the, um, the, the numbers over here, which are a little bit, oh, oh still learning right from left on this. <laughs> the numbers over here, which are a little shocking, which is they're looking at an ICU bed shortage of around 13,000 is their middle estimate. If you look at the high estimates and low estimates, is as many as 53,000 ICU beds needed or as low as 14,000. So the low estimate means there's enough ICU beds to meet everybody who needs one. The high estimate though, and there's an error bar here, we're gonna get into uh, the confidence interval when we get into around chapter nine or 10 um, in, in Wheelan. The confidence interval on this is big because there's uncertainty involved. But the high estimate would leave um, 40,000 people, approximately more, without an ICU bed. So when public health experts say this is a big deal, we need to take it seriously, this is why they're worried, is their models predict this if, and by the way, this is not business as usual, this is based on continuation of strong social distancing measures and other protective measures. This is doing the best we can without doing anything more dramatic. So when you hear people worried about this, so if you look at the total number of deaths here, the, um, the projected death count is median estimate is um, 2,208. Actually, that's an, a mean estimate, I believe. Um, but 2,208 or 2,214 deaths per day um, at its peak. Uh, could be as low as 1,100 per day, could be as high as 3,300 per day. These are big numbers we're talking about. So this, when we talk about people, being concerned about this, if you look at cumulative death toll by the 1st of June, the prediction here is a total death rate of, where did 1st of June go? Um, 81,000 people, and then by the end of summer, um, 83,000 people, based on their, their, their basic assumptions around transmission, infection rate, and mortality rates. There's a lot we don't know. Modeling uncertainty and thinking about uncertainty and probability is part of, the, of what's going on here in this that we deal with. A lot of us are uncomfortable with it. One of the things that we're gonna be talking about in the class is understanding probability and understanding some of the mental flaws we make, the mistakes we make with probability sometimes. Some more graphs really quick, some data viz here. Uh, you've probably all seen data vizs like this one from the New York Times uh, with the, the growth rate by state or by country first. And then within the US, um, these are declines in the daily growth rate we've seen um, some declines in the U.S. as well as around the world. And then here's the, here's the U.S. state uh, graphic where we see um, different states are growing at different rates. Note that the, um, the, horizontal, the vertical axis here is logarithmic, which means a straight line is an exponential growth. So you want to see these lines not being... Sorry, I forgot I'm standing in front of it. I need to learn how to use the, 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 weather, the, the weather person tool a little bit better here. But this... Um, I'll figure it out. Like this. Like this. I'm getting better. So what we're looking for with this, with this exponential, um, exponential scale right here, uh, it's a logarithmic scale. And so a straight line means that the, the number of cases is increasing exponentially at a really rapid rate. Right? Even if it's growing along one of these lower lines like this, it's increasing exponentially. It's not growing 
arithmetically, it's going from starting at, what do we got here? I can't read that very well. 20, and then 50, and then 100, then 200, then 500, then 1,000, right? So this is exponential growth either way. What we want to see happen here, we haven't seen happen in any U.S. state yet, is going flat. So no new cases, right? Um, and these, these curves aren't even starting to bend in a lot of cases. We want to see them bending a little and then getting flat, not even growing at a low exponential rate. So these, these graphics help us understand the nature of the problem in some cases, help us compare the U.S. to other places. Where's the U.S.? I'll get out of the way here. Uh, there's the U.S. So if we look at the growth rate in the U.S., we are not doing well compared to a lot of countries in the world. Uh, there's a lot of countries where, the like Italy, through really strong containment measure, you can see they were growing really fast, but now the tangent on that curve is, is declining a little bit, so things are looking better. Uh, but yeah, we, we want to think about this kind of thing, and data visualization can help us with, with this kind of understanding. Uh, I think that's enough about data visualization for now. Um, I want to get into the material that's been assigned for this quarter, for this week. There's nothing due this week. One of the things that UW Tacoma is trying to do to get everybody eased into online instruction is to not have any assignments or points out the first week. Uh, and so there's an assignment up, but while I'll introduce it, it was not due until next week. I'll put up a discussion board. You can get started on it if you want. It won't be due until next week as well. Uh, but what you can do this week is you can start the reading and there is a textbook. It's available on a Kindle uh, web store. It's available other ways, I'm sure, as a ebook. Uh, you can order a physical copy if you like. I think it'll take forever to get it. The Kindle edition is, I think, it's, it's like 10 bucks or may, maybe even less. So it's, it's a good deal. Uh, but because I know people will be scrambling and want to get started and won't have everything they need, um, I've put up the two first chapters that are assigned here just as scans, and they're just page scans. They're not nice PDFs, but you can read them, hopefully. Um, they're not bad scans to that point, um, but just page scans. And so that's chapter one of Whelan. And then there's another chapter here from Best um, on uh, social statistics. This Best book is really excellent. I really like it. It's not quite as good as Whelan for... Uh, covering all the essentials of understanding statistics. Best, though, is a professor of sociology. He's a criminologist, and he does a fantastic job of explaining how statistics, including crime statistics, are socially created. So that, that this first chapter gives us a good grounding in that idea. So the assignment for right now is to read Whelan Chapter 1 and Best Chapter 1, Damned Lies and, and Statistics is the name of... Um, best um, book and then i've got a presentation here about these things that i'll go over this will be my second lecture probably is going over this and then there are some readings that are assigned as well that are meant to complement the uh the readings if uh, the new york times has a paywall if you do a certain number of um, articles you you get paywalled out and blocked from the the website for a month so I try to post PDFs along with the links if you don't have a subscription. You should also be able to access the link through the um, UW libraries, but you'll need to search for it through the UW libraries. And so I try and post a PDF printout of it for you as well when I can. You can always send me a reminder if I've forgotten. Anyway, there's um, one, two, three readings here about, um, about data and its uses that are meant to be directly relevant to the readings that are introducing us to this idea of what statistics are useful for, what kind of things we can try and learn using statistics, and then some of the ethical challenges around knowing too much information, which is one of the big frontiers of big data and the, the modern marketing surveillance state and, and uh, just surveillance state in general that we're, we're coming into in the 2020s. Uh, there's an assignment coming up. And then there's an in-class assignment here that's probably not going to be assigned, but I'll probably have a discussion board around that instead. Um, the other thing that I want to point out really quick, and I know this is going to be a challenging quarter for a lot of us, but what I want to point out to, to you all is that I also recognize that this class is a 200-level class, and I teach it at that level. 
When I look at the enrollment though, what I see is I see a ton of juniors and almost more seniors or fifth year seniors. So I see a lot of students who have been here for a long time and maybe on the way out or even almost done it's their last quarter and they're just taking this class to fill a, to fill a requirement. That's great. But one of the things I always get on my student evaluation forms is the class didn't really challenge my thinking. And my first response to that is, yeah, because you're a senior and you're taking a 200 level class <laughs> and you know a lot already because college is working. So to address that, for those of you who are super keen, who are really eager to learn a lot and, and are bored by just the ordinary, oh, I can't believe we're just reading this easy book and I know all about this stuff already. For those of you who are not challenged enough by the, the existing work that's assigned, what I've done is I put, I put up bonus material. And so um, here's a challenge piece for you or a bonus piece for you. It's not extra credit. It's extra credit in life. You can do it and you can be smarter for having read something else. Uh, but it's not meant to be, if, if you're just trying to get through the quarter and you just want to know what's important, then that's great. But if you're looking for extra and you're not feeling intellectually stimulated enough or you just have a thirst for more, I'm going to give you plenty more too. So, uh, I, I, um, and if you want more than what I've given you, I'm more than happy to give you lots of recommendations too. All right. Uh, I feel like I've talked enough. I, there's lots more I could say. I didn't tell you all about myself, hardly at all. What am I going to do? It's okay. Um, if you, if office hours, we can, we're going to have some office hours on Zoom. You can ask me questions if you want about, about um, who I am or where I come from or uh, why I'm qualified to teach class. That would have been a good one to cover. <laughs> Uh, I do have a PhD in public policy and management, which is why I got hired to teach this class. Uh, but actually, let me end on one thing, which is I want to talk really quickly, and I hope you're still listening now because it's been a while, and, and I know that we look at viewership rates and they trail off as, as, uh, as the minutes tick on. But for those of you who are still with us right now, let me tell you really quick about why I like to teach this class, why I... Uh, it's a little bit different context now, but why I g g um, leave my office at uh, Green River, get in my car and drive to UW Tacoma through traffic and get out and park and deal with parking in the middle of the afternoon and find the classroom and teach another class. Why do I do that? Uh, the short answer is because I really appreciate the students at UW Tacoma. The community college students are great, but a lot of them can be uh, really just... Uh, uh, developing learners and so I spent a lot of time coaching and helping uh, the students do things like really fundamental tasks like like understanding how to read a textbook and and uh, how to write better essays right and, which is it's really important it's a valuable skill and I'm glad I'm doing it um, but it's really enjoyable to have so many students in a class like the the one I have here at UWT like you all that are highly motivated and and independent, really, um, really op sort of open-minded, curious thinkers um, from all walks of life. Uh, and it, it's just great. It, it feels, when I come into a classroom at UW Tacoma, I feel like I'm part of a community of learners and uh, that, that everyone has a sense of, of belonging and having a purpose there. Uh, sometimes different purposes, but everyone has a purpose. Uh, and that is really energizing for me too. And so I really thrive in that, uh, in, the, in that atmosphere. I'm gonna do my very best to re recreate that here online. That's a challenge. I'm gonna try and lean into that. Um, I hope you can uh, reciprocate and, and give it your best as well. Uh, and it's, it's okay if, if you, know, you have to check out and you have to take care of yourself too once in a while, but um, I'm here for you. So that's all for now. I'm always an email away if you need to get in touch. And thanks so much for your attention. I will talk to you all soon. Bye-bye.